So when I was growing up, uh, we had a giant poplar tree in our front yard, uh, which felt like it had millions of beautiful green leaves on it come summer. And I would spend days in this tree, hanging out in it, climbing in it. And it had this particular branch that was actually shaped like a U. It was perfect for hanging out in, reading books in, spending time in. And this branch was just hung low enough that um, if you weren't watching as an adult on your way somewhere, um, you could bump your head on it. And my father did this almost every time he went from our family home to the car. And so after having done this enough times, he announced to our family one day, uh, I'm going to cut that branch down. I think he used some explicatives, but... Um, my 11-year-old self thought, no, I, you can't. That branch means so much to me. Um, and I thought to myself, I can't let the man, quite literally in this case, uh, cut, cut the branch down. What am I going to do about this? And so I launched a Save the Branch campaign. <laughs> I, uh, I put up posters around our family home. I made signs and uh, hung them on this branch. And I staged a sit-in. <laughs> and early one morning, on a Saturday, I, uh, I sat myself in that tree and refused to come out because I knew that my father was planning on cutting the branch down that day. And, um, you know, evening came and my mom reminded me that I was 11 years old and I had a bedtime. And so I very reluctantly uh, went inside to go to bed, but vowed that I would resume my campaign early the next morning. And so at the break of dawn the next day, I went outside and the branch was gone. My father had cut it down as I slept. And this was the first time that I can remember experiencing power. In that situation, he had so much power and my voice meant nothing. Even though I actively opposed his decision to cut that branch down, he made it without my consultation. I also made a tactical error with my campaign, uh, based on an assumption which I'll talk about later. But I think this story gets at the core of what I want to talk about today, which is making change and how that happens. Um, because I think we all think about making change. You know, if it's um, new playground equipment at your child's school, or maybe you want your child to be able to go to school in the community that they live in. Um, maybe you'd like to see homelessness rates in our city decreased. Maybe you're concerned about the disappearance of the grasslands. Uh, or maybe you're sick of hearing about uh, the tar sands and oil spills and the inabilities of our governments to just hurry up and implement green energy solutions. Um, but whatever the social issue is, I think that making change and thinking about making change is natural and that we likely have all thought about doing something at some point. I think just as likely though, we've probably felt powerless to do anything about the things that we'd like to see changed. Because from the very complex um, macro societal level uh, down to the very micro um, interpersonal level, making change is bound up in power relationships. And it's natural and um, quite status quo um, for the people who designed the very complex social, uh, economic, and political systems that we live in uh, to want to keep them that way. They, these systems were designed by a certain kind of person who looks a certain way. They speak a certain language and make a certain amount of money, and it's in their best interest that the systems continue to work for them and that the people who are disadvantaged and oppressed by these systems feel like they can't do anything about them. I also think we feel disempowered to do anything because the changes that we might want to see sometimes are so big and messy and complex that how could we possibly know where to start? And so we opt to do nothing. Someone else will do it. But I believe that there's a way forward uh, through this messy complexity and that I believe if we're serious about those things that we want to see changed, we need to be serious when we're thinking about the process of how that change happens. And this is why we need to develop theories of change. So whether you're an individual or uh, working for an organization or with a community group, um, we need to come up with what success will look like if our change is implemented. And this starts with really articulating what our ultimate outcome is. In my case with the branch, my ultimate outcome was simple. I did not want that branch to be cut down. 
In the case of new playground equipment at your child's school, uh, maybe when you're talking with other parents at that school, you actually realize, you know, we just want better recreational opportunities for our children and uh, better opportunities for play. And new playground equipment might just be one piece of that puzzle. Um, but whatever it is, it's important to articulate what success is going to look like for you. And after this is done, you can start to think about what the preconditions are to making that change. Uh, so a precondition to not having my branch cut down, I assumed, was that my father understood the importance of that branch to me. A precondition to um, decreasing homelessness rates in the city might be um, battling income inequality and um, getting city councillors elected uh, who care about homelessness. And there might be um, many, many preconditions, uh, the more complex your ultimate outcome is. And some of the preconditions might be unknown, and that's okay. Um, but as long as we start to think about them, that's what's important. And once you sort of know what these preconditions to succeeding are, um, that's when the meat of the work comes. That's when you can start planning interventions. Um, that's when you can start doing the action that will lead to the change that you want to see. Um, and interventions can be anything from a one-off uh, event uh, to a set of interventions or a campaign um, to working through an organization. Um, and an intervention can take a moment or it can take a lifetime depending on what the change is that you want to see. I'll give you a few examples from uh, my own experience. So when I was working for the federal government in Ottawa, um, I noticed that the people who were making policy in this strategic branch I was working for had a unique ability to intervene from the inside, which is quite a powerful thing to be able to do. Uh, they could draft um, policy options about the changes that they wanted to see based on best practices and all the, the current research. Um, but what I also noticed here was that um, in addition to uh, the patience that it takes to uh, work from within a system, um, was also the recognition that they might never be successful. Um, that the changes that they uh, wanted to see, um, the decision-making power for those wasn't in their hands. Um, I also know a lot of people who work in the partisan political system, and uh, here, you know, they believe, and um, I have at some points as well, that the precondition of their candidates uh, being elected or their party getting into power will lead to that ultimate outcome of the policy that they want to see or the program that they want to uh, get implemented. And in many cases, it's successful. Um, and in some cases, um, maybe the person that you get elected um, it, they can't necessarily represent you on every issue, or maybe the system that they're working in prevents them from implementing the change that you want to see. So here again, no, no intervention or set of interventions will come without its challenges. Uh, another example, I've spent the last uh, four years working for uh, two nonprofit organizations who had very similar ultimate outcomes for social and environmental justice. And most of our interventions came in the form of public engagement events um, and providing community resources and funding for people to take action on issues that they're passionate about. And what I noticed here is that these organizations were often at the heart of what was going on on a lot of these issues, uh, you know, human rights, international development, food sovereignty. Um, but also that a lot of staff time was being eaten up by applying for the money to be able to do this and then reporting on it afterwards. And uh, this is a, something that most organizations of that size face uh, in the grant world where you have to apply for grants and report on them in order to make something happen. So again, any intervention has its challenges. Um, but the last one I wanted to talk about um, is uh, an intervention called a community coalition. And I was lucky enough to be a part of one of these uh, this past fall called Water Watch. And um, we formed around the issue of the proposed P3 model for the wastewater treatment plant in Regina. Uh, now, before you get your backups, <laughs> uh, your backs up, um, I don't want to talk about necessarily the issue that the referendum was held on um, so much as the model, so uh, not to worry. Um, but the community coalition was built of an incredibly diverse group of people. Um, you know, it was students, uh, professionals, nonprofit organizations, uh, smaller community groups, uh, union members, academics. And from that diversity, um, we were able to accomplish a wide array of interventions because of the skills and resources all of those people brought to the table. And what I noticed uh, by being part of this group was, although we were ultimately unsuccessful in achieving our ultimate outcome, 
um, bringing the issue of privatization into the collective conversation in Regina has remained. And that was uh, a success that came from that model of intervening. So um, within this model, and this uh, uh, theory of change model, it's called, uh, there's a woman named Andrea Anderson who does a lot of work on it. And if you're interested in the nuts and bolts, I recommend you look up her work. Um, and within it, one of the most important parts is articulating the assumptions that we're making between each level. So when we make an intervention, we do an action. Um, what are we assuming will happen that will lead to our precondition? In my tree branch example, my assumption was that if I could only articulate to my father how important that branch was to me, he wouldn't cut it down. And I based my intervention on that assumption, my sit-in, um, which failed. <coughs> If instead I had looked at that assumption and said, you know what, my father's a law-abiding citizen, he's a good guy, um, maybe I could write to my municipal, my municipal government and say, you know what, you should pass a bylaw that makes it um, untenable for people to cut down branches willy-nilly. Maybe that would have um, forced him uh, to respond in a different way. Or maybe I had said, you know what, my father, He's like anyone else, he responds to social pressure. <laughs> um, and using that assumption, instead had a set of interventions which um, was, say, a campaign on my block to cultivate a sense of respect for nature uh, regardless of its inconvenience to you. And if that st status quo reality had existed, it might have been much harder for him to cut that branch down. And so within this system, I think the last thing is it's also really important to uh, take stock of your own skills and abilities and exactly how um, you are going to contribute to making the change uh, to be most uh, successful. And um, this isn't to say that uh, you shouldn't try to do things that you're not good at, um, but it is to say that different people will have different amounts of time to contribute to change-making activities, um, different skills and resources, different privileges, um, and different kinds of access. Um, and so I'll just end with a story about um, how I see my role in making change and how I think change happens. So I'm from a small town called Watrous. And um, like any small town, uh, most of our events were held in the Civic Center. And if you're from small towns, even if you're not, you know the complex that I'm talking about. It's this big, uh, empty box that you have to repurpose for every single event, um, for fundraisers, for um, wedding receptions, for music festivals. Um, it always has to be set up for uh, whatever you're doing. And since my parents were often on the organizing end of things in our town, um, we would be some of the first people to arrive. And so it was my job to sort of pull the chairs out from underneath the stage. You guys know what I'm talking about, those long rail things. Um, unstack them and lay them all out in rows for um, the event. Then the event would happen and afterwards um, all of the chairs would need to be stacked. And watching my whole community contribute to stacking those chairs up after whatever event it was, and it would be different people for different kinds of events. Um, was so inspiring to me. And, you know, I still do this. Like, almost weekly, I'm stacking chairs for something. And I think what that tells me about how I think change happens is that my role is one of setting up spaces, whether they be physical or um, sort of more metaphorical, spaces where communities can come together and talk about issues that, they, that matter to them. Um, setting up spaces um, for dissent and for disruption, setting up spaces for um, empowerment and ways forward. And so I would just ask of, of you all, um, if there are things that you want to see changed, and I'm guessing that there are, what does your theory of change look like? And within that, who, um, which groups or what issues are you going to stack chairs for? Thank you.